Hey everybody, welcome back to Organic Chemistry. Now we're going to go over the ultraviolet visible spectroscopy technique that we use with conjugated systems and um, you know, basically understand how uh, the interaction of, of energy and matter relate. So uh, remember, uh, spectroscopy in general, so let's just do number one, we'll do a review. And so spectroscopy is the study of how matter interacts with energy. Okay, so we insert energy into a system and we see that what response comes out of it. And um, of course we use the electromagnetic radiation as our energy source, right? So our, radi our, our energy source is the electromagnetic radiation. Now remember that when we're dealing with the electromagnetic radiation, that, um, or the EMS, right, electromagnetic spectrum, what, and what we're basically dealing with is different frequencies of energy or wavelengths of energy. So as a review, I just want to re remind us, um, actually, uh, let me uh, pull this up first, and let's take a look at this for a moment. So here's our uh, chart from the book. This is straight from our textbook on page uh, 606, but Basically, what we're seeing here is that we have different uh, either wavelengths or frequencies. So wavelength is down here at the bottom, going from left to right, increasing. And frequency is the opposite. It's going from right towards the left, right? So we're going in this direction. And what we see is that we have different uh, uh, wavelengths or frequencies depending upon what we're trying to uh, interact with. So what kind of molecule. And so we've talked about radio frequency, for example like the microwaves, we've talked about infrared, and we've also talked about, um, well, what we're going to do now is UV invisible spectroscopy. So as you can see here, uh, if you recall, IR was used to determine functional groups. So we use that to figure out what functional groups we had. Whereas NMR, which uses radio frequency, was used to uh, determine, which is microwaves, was used to determine exactly what kind of connectivity we have. So that was the key for connectivity. And finally, what we're going to do now is the UV, visible spectroscopy, and that's going to tell us about conjugated systems. Okay, so it's going to tell us about double bond relationships within a molecule. So these are the different spectroscopy techniques. And now these two we know are not going to probably come up on this exam or in any of the future exams, but UV visible should come up during this exam because that's something that's uh, brand new for you guys. So let's go a little bit further into review and let's just remind ourselves what it is to be, uh, what a wavelength is, right? So wavelength, which we express as lambda, is actually measuring the distance of a cycle. So for example, let's say we have a bunch of cycles. Okay, and now this is one second in time. So we have to have some time measure. Well, if we measure the distance between two peaks, or you could do the same down below, right? Two troughs. But the peak is what I'll focus on. This right here tells me the wavelength, right? So that's wavelength. This is lambda. Now, it turns out that for a given time period, and let's say one second, we could measure that and see whether it's long or short. So for example, if we have a lot of hills to climb, then you could see how the distance here would become, and this isn't the greatest drawing, but the shorter distance, maybe I should uh, fill one more in there, okay, to keep it consistent. But at any rate, if you look at any two peaks, any two tops of the hills, you could measure the distance between them. And so this is a shorter wavelength, right? It's got shorter compared to this one, which is longer. So when you compare the distances, that'll tell you the wavelength. Now, what does it mean? Well, the other term that we should consider before doing this, and so, by the way, this is the measurement, measures the distance 
between two consecutive peaks. Okay, so that's our definition for wavelength. Now, if we consider the opposite, which is frequency, and frequency, we have this V to, deter, to, to express frequency, and this is in hertz, right? Or some, yeah, usually it's hertz. And by the way, this is in nanometers, right? So we, do the, we express this in nanometers. Right? And so that's the distance that we're using, that's the measurement. Well, in the case of frequency, it's how frequent you go through these cycles. So again, let's measure two different charts, both being one second long. So here's one second as well. And now, if we look at, let's say, something like this, and we compare it to something like this, notice that within one second, the cycles are more frequent. It occurs more frequently. So it's the number of cycles per given time, per time. And so the more cycles, the higher the frequency. And so more cycles equals higher, sorry, frequency. And think about it in terms of energy. Um, when you have energy, the, the more cycles you're going through per given time, the more energy it's going to be in terms of its energy state, the more energy required to do that. So it's a higher energy state as you go through more cycles. Okay, so notice also that if I measure the distance here, the lambda, it's going to be longer here, and it's going to be, let's say, shorter here, shorter. So there's a inverse relationship, right? So the greater the frequency equals a longer, oh sorry, whoops, a shorter, all right, decrease, wavelength. And now frequency is directly related to energy. So they're proportional to each other. If you increase frequency, that means an increase in energy. So longer wavelengths are lower frequency, which means lower energy. Whereas shorter wavelengths is a higher frequency, which means higher energy, right? And so we can see that relationship. So again, just to write that out, longer lambda equals lower energy because it's a lower frequency. The distance between them is larger, which means less cycles per given time. Whereas a shorter lambda wavelength equals higher energy or higher frequency, okay? Higher frequency. And there's the relationships that we need to keep an eye on. Okay, so that's basically what we're working with. And now look, let's go back to our chart. So let's take a look one more time at this diagram and we can identify a few things from this information that we just discussed. So the first thing I want to recognize is that if we're increasing the wavelength in this direction, that means that this is lower energy over here, right? And so visible is higher energy than IR and for NMR. We're using a higher energy source because we're going to be working from within this range here or, ne or what's called near ultraviolet, near UV. Um, and that's, those are the two that we're working with. So they're higher in energy. This is the highest energy source that we're going to insert into the molecule compared to the other spectroscopy techniques that we used. And now, so our goal for this section is going to be the UV visible region, which we kind of blow up right here. But let's just identify that from 200 to 400 nanometers is our UV whereas visible starts at 400 and it goes up to around 750 nanometers. So that's visible. Okay, so which one requires more energy? Well, if you think about it, and by the way, you can see the trend up here, the increase in frequency, UV is a higher energy source than visible, right? And so that's what we're seeing. So we need higher energy to get into the UV, visible, uh, the UV region and lower energy for the visible region. Another thing I want you to recognize is the pattern here. We have blue within the visible. We have blue, green, and red, BGR. So 
the highest in energy is the blue.